Part 1. You will hear two students, Jacinta and Lewis, discussing a holiday they are planning in Queenstown, a tourist centre in New Zealand popular with young people. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, Lewis. It's Jacinta here. Oh, hi, Jacinta. I was just going to call you. I was thinking we ought to do something about accommodation for our trip to Queenstown. Yeah, actually, that's just why I rang you. I've been looking on the internet. There was one place that looked OK called Traveller's Lodge. But when I checked availability for January, when we're planning to go, I found it was fully booked. Right. Well, we'd better do something now, I suppose. I've actually got a list up here on the computer. There's one place called Bingley's that looks possible. It's $19.75 a night. That's US dollars. They quote all the prices in US dollars. So that's about 26 or 27 New Zealand dollars. That's OK. That'll be in a dormitory, is it? Yeah, they say eight-bed dorms, and the hostel's right in the town centre, and they've got a cafe. They have theme nights every weekend, whatever that means. Oh, you know, like certain sorts of food and music. And people might wear special clothes, like that Egyptian evening we went to last year. Oh, OK. What else? They've got a sun deck area, and then all the usual things, internet access and so on. Sounds good. Was there anywhere else? Yeah, a couple more places. There's one called Chalet Lodge, which is just 18 US dollars. That's for a bed in a 12-bed dorm. They do single and family rooms as well. It looks as if it's a bit out of town, says it's got an alpine setting, a quiet alpine setting. What do you think? Not sure. Oh, but actually it's not far out at all. It says 10 minutes walk from town, so... Oh, and it says it's children-friendly. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. What about the third place? Uh, that's called Globetrotters. Let's see. They do private rooms or five-bed dorms for 1850 It's in the centre, just by the lake, and that includes breakfast. Didn't the other two? I don't think so. They didn't mention it, so probably not. Oh, and it says something about a free skydive. Wow. Don't know if I'm all that keen on jumping out of aeroplanes. Oh, actually, what it says is you can win a chance to do a skydive. They give one away every day to one of the guests. Well, if I win it, you can do it. Anyway, do they have room? Yeah, I checked the availability. Shall I go ahead and book there then? Fine. You now have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I was looking at what there is to do too. There are lots of sites offering deals for adventure sports. (laughs) I suppose we have to do a bungee jump. Why? 
Well, it's Queenstown where they more or less started it as a sport. You can, if you really want to jump off the side of a bridge with an elastic rope tied round your ankles. I'll watch. OK, so what do you want to do? As far as adventure sports go, I was talking to someone who went whitewater rafting there. He said it was really awesome. They drive you up the Shotover River and then you come down on a rubber raft through the whitewater rapids where the river's really narrow and fast and end up going through a tunnel nearly 200 metres long. I think it's quite expensive, though. Oh, I'm on for that if you are. Cool. The other thing you can do is the jet boat ride. That sounded just a lot of noise, though. It's basically just whizzing round on the river on a very fast boat, isn't it? My friend did that as well. He said it was a bit touristy, but worth it. I'll give it a go. You go right up the River Canyon. He said the drivers were really skilful, But I don't mind going on my own. But there's lots to do as well as the whole commercial adventure bit. We ought to do some trekking. The scenery round there's amazing. I don't want to miss that. The place to start's Glenorchy, apparently, about 40 minutes' drive. That's where lots of the wilderness trails begin. OK. I'll pack my walking boots. I'd better start getting in training. I haven't done anything except sit at my desk for months. Now, is there anything else we need to decide? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture about psychology. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. In this lecture, I want to introduce you to the life and work of a famous psychologist, a psychologist who had a big influence on the field of social psychology. Social psychology deals with group behaviour and the individual as a member of a group, and Solomon Ash made a most important contribution. Solomon Ash worked mostly in the USA, but he was born in 1907 in Poland, and he came to the US when he was 13. He went to an ordinary high school, and as he had an interest in human behaviour, he decided to study psychology. He was quite disappointed with his first acquaintance with psychology. It seemed to be all about rats and mice, and that didn't interest him at all. However, he persevered and eventually became a professor of psychology. Now, the experiment which made his name is called the line judgment task. Participants were asked to compare some simple lines. More precisely, they were given a card with three lines, then were asked to compare another single line and say whether it was longer or shorter than the lines on the card. What a participant didn't know was that in reality, all the other participants were effectively actors. That is, they were instructed to give a wrong judgment and the purpose of the experiment was to see how the single subject would react. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk.
The subject would hear the others saying things about the length of the line which were clearly false. Most subjects answered correctly, in spite of the incorrect judgments of the others, but a proportion, 32%, conformed to the majority view, the incorrect view. This proportion was much, much higher than anticipated. Before the experiments, they'd thought 15% or lower might do this. To give you a bit more detail, I have an illustration up here on the board. A group of six or seven people were given a card with three lines on it. There is a short vertical line, on the right of which is a longer line, and on the right of that there is another still longer line. However, it's clear that the longest line is the right-hand one, the second longest, the middle one, and the shortest is the one on the left. The participants were given a second card with just one line on it. I should add that in these experiments people became very distressed. They found it very hard to deal with a situation where people were telling them things which were against the evidence of their own eyes. One woman became extremely agitated, running about measuring and looking and checking and shouting in a kind of massive anxiety. Now, what experiments which occurred some time later found was that other factors can influence the result. For example, when there were more so-called participants, there was even more conformity. On the other hand, when people were able to respond in secrecy, by writing the result down, for instance, they made fewer incorrect judgments about the lines. Subjects gave various explanations for why they made the decisions they did. Although they weren't put under pressure by the experimenter, many felt that they would somehow spoil the experiment and upset the person running it if they didn't agree, no matter how stupid they felt. More simply, in other cases, they said they just wanted to not show themselves in a bad light. Whatever the reason, Ash's experiment has had a long history, and although incredibly... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Peter Walsh being interviewed for a job. Listen and choose the correct answer for each question. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Joanne! Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin, and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well... Where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end, because it's right up at the northern end of Australia, and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists, People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia. Probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realize until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. 
Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art, music, dancing, and so on are concerned, because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theater and opera in the same way as cities down in the South, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves. Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artist groups and writers groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international. Yeah. They say there are over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but mm, when a very bad storm, uh, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious center today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see the places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year, it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles, too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And answer the questions. Please sit down, Mr. Walsh. My name's Jane Swain, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to chat about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Weston's? It is Weston's, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I am not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2005. Is that right? Yes, 2005. Then I was unemployed for about three months. And then I traveled around America for a few months. So, yes... It must be about three years now, in fact. Hmm, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change jobs? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting and stimulating. The salary's okay, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh, my dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. The other people are great. There's a good cooperative atmosphere. I mean, among the staff, and compared to other companies, the conditions are great. I mean, the office itself and the working conditions. 
Hmm. And then there's the fact that they give me lots of room for initiative and let me make decisions. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. Yes, well, we're looking for someone like that. You know, someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. And what about your education? You went to Manchester University, didn't you? Uh, yes. After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design, but I decided to give it up and did an arts degree at university instead. Good. And have you done any courses since? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about product life cycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm going to begin my lecture today with a look at product life cycles. Now, as we go through the product life cycle, I will be trying to raise some issues which are important with regard to each phase of the cycle. I won't have all the answers for you this morning. This one of the lecture series is just to get you started and, uh, I hope, interested. Let's start with the first phase of the cycle, that of product design. This is really the most important part of the cycle. We often talk as if it is consumers who are responsible for recycling, and so they are, but in reality the major responsibility must be borne by designers. They can design products where recycling is easy and cheap, or difficult and expensive. In the latter case, the likelihood is that recycling, though technically feasible, will not in fact take place. Now, don't jump ahead, because the second stage is not product manufacturing, but rather that of materials acquisition. This is the activity we do when we mine coal or other minerals such as gold or iron or copper. In addition to mining, there is harvesting, which includes the cutting down of trees as a first step in the making of furniture or paper, or fishing. These activities have costs which are not only money costs. Pollution is one of the extra costs. We have also to think whether the resources we use are renewable, such as trees, or not, such as coal and other minerals. The third stage is not manufacturing either. It is materials processing. This is where we take the raw materials and use energy to change them into a form that can be used in manufacturing. Uh, for example, trees must be turned into paper or oil into plastic. The cotton plants that grow in the fields must be turned into cloth. All of these activities require the use of chemical processes and, as with all chemical processes, waste is produced often of a dangerous kind. And now we come to the manufacturing stage. This is usually the most expensive in terms of cost and energy and waste. The wastes are often those that contribute to global climate change. For example, 
We make 41 billion glass containers, mostly bottles, each year, and we throw most of them away. A lot of manufacturing seems unnecessary if we could only organize things better. And this could mean greater profits for the manufacturing companies too. Stage five is packaging. Many products are packed in paper or plastic, which themselves, of course, have their own processes and costs. Excessive packaging is often criticised, but it must be remembered that packaging serves a purpose, often more than one purpose, such as maintaining freshness and hygiene, as well as providing information. In our globalised world, we must never forget the next stage, which is distribution. This is the stage where transportation and energy play a big part. Lorries, trucks, trains, planes, and ships all use up the precious stocks of oil, and, as we know, generate greenhouse gases, which, as we hear again and again, contribute to climate change. Stage seven is the point of it all: using the product. Looking after products, using them in the recommended ways, timely repair and maintenance all reduce the need for early replacement and reduce the number of products in landfill sites. We should not encourage the purchase of single-use products, that is, products which are designed for use on one occasion only and then to be thrown away and replaced. Um, I'm going to skip a stage for a moment and move straight on to the final stage, which is disposal, putting the product in the bin. This is the end of the life of the product, and we lose it completely. It may have only a little value, but it does have a value even at this stage of its life, even in fact when it's actually in the landfill site. Now I missed out one stage. This is a cycle within a cycle. That is, within the life cycle of the product, there can be a closed loop cycle which can extract more value from the product. This is the reuse and recycle loop. It is a closed loop because, in theory, it can continue forever. Though in practice, of course, this is not possible. Recycling products mean that they can be used to make more of the same product. Uh, CDs, bottles, books, or that they can be used to make different ones. For example, one pound of recycled paper can make six cereal boxes. And if we recycled all our newspapers, we could save forty thousand trees a day. Now, with this approach to the life cycle of a product in mind, we can go on to consider life cycle analysis. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS Listening Answer Sheet.